Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Roshan Kainisen, your former MC and now moderator for this panel session. Uh, we're going to be talking about reshaping the future of digital wealth. We've got 45 minutes on the clock. And at any point during this session, if anyone has any questions, just put up your hands and we'll take it as we go along with the session, kind of integrate it into our conversation. Um, if uh, Vincent can help me look online for any questions, just WhatsApp them to me and I will take them as well. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, it's no secret that we are seeing a change of behavior when it comes to uh, investing in digital wealth, the advent of robo-advisors, of cryptocurrencies, and the digitalization of investment products has been an interesting journey for many. Uh, all four uh, panelists here represent different parts of that. Uh, we have two robos, though, but we have crypto, and we also have one of the biggest fund managers in the country uh, on our panel here today. Uh, so once again, let me introduce everybody here. On our far right, we have Mohammad Azlan Masud. He's the COO of Amana Sam National Barhat. Thank you so much for joining us today. Scarlett Chai, country manager of Luna Malaysia. Congratulations uh, uh, on being, being country manager. Uh, Mr. Ian Lloyd, Chief Digital Officer, Kananga Investment Bank, Barhat. And uh, as well as Wong Wai Ken, country manager from the Wealth Tech Winner of the Year, Stash Away. Nicely done. <laughs> So I think we'll start with the Wealth Tech winner, given that he's right on my right-hand side here. Um, Ken Stashaway was the first robo-advisor, or more specifically for the Malaysian context, digital investment manager here in Malaysia. By all accounts, looks to be the market leader, and uh, has, but it hasn't been the smoothest journey for anyone in digital wealth. Give us yep. a sense of how the market dynamics of digital wealth have changed from the time Stashaway started in Malaysia in 2018 hmm. till today. Yeah, I think for anyone in fintech, it's, it's always going to be difficult. Um, Han just talked about his journey and he chose it because it's exciting. And if it's difficult, then, you know, that's just part of the journey, right? Like I talk about what we're trying to do all the time. And I tell people that are in banks, I tell normal people and they say, that sounds very hard. And then I'd say to them sarcastically, oh, you should have told me it was hard. I should have stayed in bed. <laughs> and I, oh, okay. You told me it's difficult. Oh, sorry. So I didn't know there were big unit trusts. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But um, it has been interesting and it's been amazing. If you told me five years ago we'll be in this position now, managing more than 100,000 uh, clients' money over a, a billion bucks, I'll let you uh, ponder whether that's ringgit or, or dollars. I'll be coy and, and sneaky like that. But no, I think, I think we're, we're the market leader and we deserve to be there. But once we reach certain milestones, I'm, at the same time, I'm not surprised that we're here. You know, you, you said earlier that um, the way clients invest and the way they build wealth is, is different. But what always stays the same is that clients want the number to go up. What that ex exactly is depends. So you have to be gatekeepers and you have to be very discerning, listen to them half the time, but respect your position that you are a gatekeeper and you're supposed to know better than the, than the, than the investor. So five years in, I would just say that we're just getting started. All right, thank you very much. Um, Ian, Kenanga made a bit of a splash last year when you introduced KDI Invest, uh, that time using the terminology such as uh, AI before ChatGPT took and uh, absorbed all of that for its own market, uh, for its own branding. Now, the term AI has caught fire since then, but talk to us a little bit about the integration of AI into KDI and how you see the robo-advisor platform developing from here on out. Great. That's a, actually a really great question because the, the investment landscape is constantly changing and evolving like, like uh, uh, Ken said. We, we see AI or at least uh, algorithmic trading, algorithmic portfolio management as being very important, particularly to provide um, uh, more retail customers with lower cost of entry to come in to access a well-diversified, well-managed, professionally managed portfolio. That was the whole reason we made KDI in the first place. So we took all of the knowledge from Kananga, all of our fund management experience, kind of wrapped it up inside an algorithmic approach using a lot of data to feed in, calculate a model portfolio, get it back out to customers in a very, very automated fashion. It's actually almost, there's almost no human interaction when you, when you deal with the portfolio. The humans monitor it, they have the dead man switch in case something goes wrong, but we don't interfere with how it runs, generally speaking. Um, so what we see, we do see that continuing. We see offering these kind of um, curated, like you said, it's a gatekeeping process. We have to apply our knowledge to it. 
we have to give good sound uh, products and services to our customers that are safe and fit their risk profiles. Um, but we do see AI being a really important part of that as we go forward. So we are going to see that more. Um, we've been a bit quiet because we're looking at creating new algorithmic portfolios. They do take time to build. They do take time to train. Um, but we're creating them, designing them, and seeing what makes sense for our customers and for the risk profiles. And just a quick follow-up to that. Um, one of the key challenges, and I think I'll follow up with Ken as well on this, with any digital wealth product is just communication with the client. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, I worked with Ringgit Plus when they built up their financial planning product. So I spoke to a lot of clients. I was with a robo advisor for a while as well. And you know, when you try to explain people things like algorithm and AI, glass eye, we're done. You know, we've lost the person. Um, have you seen similar challenges with the uh, with communicating with clients? The differentiation that AI and all these different tech tools bring to the product. Uh, Ian. Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry, yeah, I should have made that a bit clearer. Apologies for that. <laughs> um, okay, really great point as well. Uh, if, if, I'm, if I was to go back, let's say, two years ago when we launched, one thing I would try to do better is communicate it better because you're right. It is very esoteric. It, it doesn't make sense. At the end of the day, you just want to know, is your portfolio going up? You know, is it green? Um, so what we, we have been looking at is how do, we, how do we articulate that better? How do we explain it in ways that make it easy and understandable? Uh, we've always focused on you know, low ticket entries, let, you, let the AI manage it, let the AI manage the risk for you, all that good stuff. But at the end of the day, it really comes down to, are you doing the returns? Are you getting back to your customers what they want? Uh, Ken, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I first want to say that AI or algo or whatever investment framework you have is not magic. And, and I think what people are really asking is, am I okay? Is my money safe with you? Should I trust you? And how you answer that changes through time because markets change. You have to explain what is affecting the portfolio, but that is what they always ask. Do I still trust you? Even if you're down, even if you're up, do I, do I still go on this ride? And I think that's something that we have to do better as, as digital interfaces, right? We have to build trust. So, so and, and the track record speaks for itself. So sooner or later, does your product work, right? And we'll get into trust a little further as well, customer acquisition trends and things like that. Um, Scarlett, we can't talk about digital wealth without talking about uh, crypto. And when it comes to the Malaysian market, Luno is the market leader. Uh, in fact, Malaysia is uh, Luno's, one of Luno's strongest markets, if I'm not mistaken, over 800,000 Malaysian users by the end, at, as at end 2022. Uh, that's it. Tougher risk off market now. Uh, people are looking for safety. Um, so what can you tell us about the products and solutions that Luno is working on to retain uh, people? What kind of innovations uh, do you have cooking to retain and acquire new customers? Say perhaps um, staking, index tracking, perhaps? Yeah, great question there, Roshan. Uh, I think uh, in Luno, we are always listening to our customers' requests or demands. Uh, but I think it's more on how do we actually build or launch something that they want uh, alongside with the existing regulatory requirements. So there's a lot of work that's being on the background, you know, working closely with regulators, uh, which is Securities Commission. How do we introduce new product offerings, you know, without compromising in terms of compliance measures, security, safety, and everything. So I think uh, Luno has been committed, uh, it's on the mission to put the power of crypto or digital assets on everyone's hands. And for us on the front, we have been working very hard uh, with partners, regulators, policymakers to introduce um, new product offerings, like I mentioned. So I think um, what we have launched uh, that is suitable for both new and existing uh, users that is investing on our platform, I think I could just share a little bit. I think first of all, I think recently we launched Multibuy, which is a product that we uh, allow users to diversify their investment portfolio in a single purchase. So you don't, we have recommendations to say what's the most popular crypto or if you like a different combination that you would like with a single click. So it's all about convenience and simplicity. And second of all, I think in Malaysia or in Asia, the word of mouth or referral works wonder. So that's why you know, we also implemented a very uh, attractive uh, tiered referral program that, you know, that allows uh, our users or investors to continue to cultivate that you know, putting the power of crypto in everyone's hand by referring their family and friends and by at the same time also earning rewards at the same time. So that's really important, right? 
And lastly, I think it's more on um, the product offerings such as the cryptos that we have uh, available on our platform. I could say that in the last few years or so, we have dub doubled our investable uh, digital assets, uh, which is crypto on our platform. At, as of uh, today, we have 10 cryptocurrency offerings uh, that is approved by the regulators and allowed for Malaysian investors to buy, sell and store safely. And I'm very proud to announce also and share that uh, the latest crypto offering which is the 11th crypto that we are offering on our platform. It's Polygon Matic that is going live today, five o'clock onwards to all Malaysian investors. So we're always in this continuous journey and mission to improve our product, you know, improve our service to you know, re retain as well as uh, get our customers to enjoy using our platform. Thanks, Rashid. Uh, nice announcement there. And also, I think we've got a few other ones. BNM also announced. So you picked a good day, La Vincent, to have an event. Huh? You had the foresight, like crystal ball somewhere there. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> um, uh, Scarlett, um, I spoke to JL James Lane again a few weeks back. And from my conversation, it seems that Luna is trying to find this balance between, yes, you want to bring in the wild, wild, what is considered the wild, wild west of crypto, but you're trying to make it safe for people to play in. That's not a fine, that's quite a tightrope to walk. Talk to us a bit about the challenges in doing that. Yeah, it's more about, like, I think it's all about like, how do we actually uh, introduce stuff or, you know, like you say, the Wild Wild West uh, into uh, a regulated space uh, without inhibiting uh, innovation, right? How do we be safe, compliant, without in inhibiting, inhibiting uh, the, cha the uh, restrictions or whatever it is, uh, risks. But I think it's all down to how we actually collaborate with um, stakeholders such as the regulators, policymakers, and other uh, relevant industry partners. Uh, how do we introduce this? I think we have have an ongoing robust conversations and collaborative relationship with the regulators. Uh, and I'm very happy to share that, you know, our regulators in Malaysia is very progressive and they're very open to discuss uh, or learn from each other what will be uh, important or good to introduce in the market. So I really appreciate it. And we have very strong relationships in terms of that. So that's why I think for us, it's not more of challenge, it's just more on um, increasing the awareness as well as the effort to begin discussion and also come to a middle ground on what is suitable to be introduced in the market at what timing in that sense, yeah. Now, um, Aslan, you are the big fish in this small pond here. Uh, ASNB is a, a massive fund manager to say the least. Um, but your digitalization journey is also taking a little bit of a step up in recent years. The app it was launched, I think it was last year, the year before, uh, but also the recent partnership with TNG uh, eWallet, a big play there. I think you're expecting to onboard more than 1 million unit holders yearly on the platform to invest in unit trust through that partnership, uh, the Go Invest feature on that partnership. Now, on top of uh, that, ASNB funds are utilized by a sister robo advisor, uh, Raise Malaysia, for its portfolios. Talk to us a little bit about the extent of ASNB's push into the digital age and what else you're working on, because it's fair to say that you might move markets if you decided to do something. Yeah, thanks, Roshan. So, probably not the big fish, but probably the dinosaur inside this room. Because PNB has been around for more than 40 years. And I think some of the founders of fintechs are probably not even born by the time <laughs> PNB started in 1978. So if there's ever a commitment for a large organization or traditional organization like PNB is, or ASNB, is the fact that the current CEO of ASNB is the former chief technology officer of PNB. So if there's ever a commitment by PNB and ASNB to embrace digital moving forward is having a former CTO at its current CEO. In terms of his digital offering, my SNB started back in 2017. So again, this is the dinosaur in the room, I guess. So we are working to continually enhance the experience because I think one of the things that fintechs will always struggle upon starting up a new venture is always the stickiness factor. Know, making sure that the customers come back. So despite being the largest unit trust management company in Malaysia, we cannot take that for granted. We have to continue to improve the customer experience, whether it's digital or physical. 
And because ASNB serves a wide demographic of unit holders and customers, literally from the cradle to the grave, we can't just say that in the next five years, ASMB is just going to focus on digital and then just leave the mom and pops that still go to the branch because we need to make sure that they too are not left behind. Um, Azan, you mentioned feeling like a dinosaur. Now, I have papers here. Everyone else I've seen on presentations has had tablets, so I'm also feeling a bit of like, like a dinosaur here. Um, but speaking of old tech, um, ASMB has a particularly interesting challenge as opposed to the other players here, which were digital first. 32 branches across the country, more than 2,700 Asian branches nationwide. So you've got a strong physical presence and the agency networks have been very good in terms of uh, the ability to sell investment products over the last few, few decades. How are you guys managing the balance between pushing these digital channels uh, like Reyes, like DNGE Wallet, while managing the relationships with the agency network? That's a key challenge, challenge not for, just for you, but any of the big players uh, who are moving into digital. Um, I think for us, it's always about ensuring our stakeholders are quote-unquote happy. So whether that's happy in terms of getting the attention from ASNB when we go out and do marketing that they are brought together with us. And also, obviously, the commercial side, everybody wants a trailer fee somehow or commission or something. So ASNB and PNB always prefers its customers to be channel agnostic. We don't prefer the customers to go to a certain channel or to a certain agent bank. Um, so for example, my SNB is built on an API platform where actually anybody who wants to connect to PNB and ASNB can. So you can, for example, Touch and Go is actually our first digital distributor of unit trust funds. And we are also encouraging for our traditional agent banks to also migrate over uh, from their current internet banking, which is batch mode, into the real-time integration via API. So balancing that, it's also important because even from the channel's perspective, the banks, um, especially the traditional banks, they would actually want to move the customers to digital because to, the cost to serve per customer over the counter is a lot more expensive as compared to digital. So there's always a tug of war. Um, as far as ASNB as a business as a whole is concerned, our ratio between the traditional channel in terms of sales and revenue and the digital is almost at parity. So that means that there will come a point where the digital side will actually overtake. I'm sure uh, Ian would probably also attest to that. But moving forward, I think there will always be a need to balance between both. Um, and then there is also the commercial side that we need to balance because even the agents will continue to ask, for example, uh, why should I sell ASNB's unit trust when Stashaway's unit trust is giving me more. For example, John <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, thank you, Azan. Um, actually, uh, Ian, I, I always, you know, when I, whenever I look at you, I always think of KDI Invest, but really you operate at a Kananga Group level in terms of the digital offering. So, you might also face that kind of tug of war. Uh, how much of that are you, I guess, exposed to and the kind of mandates you get from the group in terms of how far you want to see digital grow? So, that's. Um we're coming back to it, agents and remisers are still incredibly important in Malaysia. Um, vastly, vastly important because they, they provide a lot more than just a channel for selling the product. They give you advice. They give you tips, suggestions, things to do, things to think about. They surface opportunities too they might not be aware of. So it's still incredibly, incredibly important. So Kananga always has to balance as we do these digital projects like KDI. Uh, how do we position that vis-a-vis -vis the agents and remisers? make certain that they are kept in the loop, supported as they go through. So KDI itself currently doesn't do unit trusts because it's, a, it's its own standalone product. So it stands apart from our unit trust business or asset management business. Um, it's uh, designed as a specific channel targeting a very specific market that we don't normally are able to penetrate. And I'm very happy to say, I'm sure you've, you noticed it as well, that your, your demographics are much lower in the digital channels. Uh, for example, we've seen in, in Kanaga in our traditional side, in the agents and remiser space, they could be 50, 60 year old, predominantly men. When you come into the digital space, we've seen it's more 50-50 split men and women and much, much younger in the 25 to 35 range. So it's a, it's a 
They serve different purposes. And so we always balance the two as we go. But exactly, as we look at digital projects, as we look at providing APIs for our own unit trusts, for our equities and everything else that we do, we, um, we're always constantly balancing that. How do we serve both their agents and remisers and make certain that they're still a, a very key part of our business while at the same time providing new channels for distribution? I guess there's also a little bit of like a longer trajectory because the younger demographic uh, may not have as much um, wealth to invest as the older demographic. So you're, you've got a bit of a longer tail growth on both sides there, on the digital side, sorry. Now uh, to uh, Scarlett and Ken, um, similar vein, but onto the digital side of things. Um, whenever I used to speak to uh, clients about digital wealth, you have to target a very, it, it, being young is not enough of a target market, right? You have to be digital savvy, digital first. Um, and a lot of times this comes with digital marketing costs and customer acquisition is a particularly interesting balance because it can be expensive. Um, Stashway would know, Stashway has done a lot of marketing over the last few years. Scarlett Luno has always done a lot of customer acquisition spend over the last few years. So talk to us about the, and the human element is also very powerful, right? In terms of, giving comfort and reassurance to the end client or the end user. Um, how are the two of you trying to address this or deal with this in your own ways and I guess overcome it, um, Scarlett? Yeah, so I think the human touch point is definitely important. Yeah, but I think for Luno, we are digital first. Uh, I think Luno on the, front, on the front has always been like a education first approach. So that's why we, we have very comprehensive um, uh, help center articles uh, that is in uh, bite-sized format so that, you know, uh, whether or not you're a new investors or, you know, advanced investors, you are easily, uh, you can consume the information easily. So we're not overwhelming you with like paragraphs of like things to read and, and digest. So I think uh, we have the help center articles to guide people. And also we also have a, a very, uh, full pack Luno Discover, where we have like videos, like short articles, like uh, stuff to, to also guide people to stay informed about industry updates. So those are like the knowledge banks that we have. But in terms of like the customer support, like I mentioned, human touch points is still important. That's why I think um, our customer support team are also equipped with the right skill sets as well as technical knowledge, uh, where they can reach out to us, whether in, uh, in email or live chats, or even calls where if a customers require support in terms of understanding a topic or what, like Luno is always there to support them to, to get to know about the topic or the investment class that they're investing in better or even their experience in using the Luno platform. Um, not only that, we uh, I know the AI is a buzzword, but in fact, Luno also has, uh, we have this chat bot uh, is AI powered that's actually also helping uh, our customers to resolve their queries in a much faster and quicker manner. So uh, if and only with like, let's say the uh, customers are requires a call because uh, maybe because due to language barrier or they just really wanted more assurance from the Luno team on understanding a particular query that they have, that's where calls as well as a direct contact with our agents is still available. So that's something that we are committed to invest and grow this part so that we are always readily available to support our customers throughout their uh, crypto investing journey. Uh, Ken, over to you. In terms of, um, I guess, how Stashway, so there's a lot of content marketing on Luno's side, as well as having that digital, ready, digital first customer support. Um, how is uh, Stashway managing this, both I mean, either from a Malaysian perspective or a much wider perspective, if you'd like, as well? Hmm. So, so I think, at, at, at this point in time, digital marketing is is very well established. There are a lot of toolkits that your CMO and digital marketing guys uh, can put to work. That space is continually invest, um, changing as well. Um, once Apple kind of shielded customer data from from the advertisers, you know Android did the same. It's it's much harder and therefore much more expensive to really do retargeting, right? So, which is something you just have to roll with. But I think I want to shift it a little bit to um, internally, right? So once, once we have the customer, we should also not think that they are homogenous and, uh, and, and, and to be treated the same. So each customer is somewhat different going along a different journey with StashAway. Whether you are five years in, three years in, or you just joined us, 
you are in different products, you might be up, you might be down. And I think the message to the client needs to be curated, right? So we need to understand your emotional landscape and what we tell you when. So if let's say you start with us with a, a cash product and you're like, I'm, I'm pretty happy with uh, the, the returns that I have, then you should really be exploring more investment opportunities abroad, right? Don't just stay in cash. Um, if let's say you have endured 2022, where the, the bear market where S&P was down almost 30%, and you might be still down this year, what exactly do we, do we tell you? This, this year, uh, there was a rally, but maybe you're just recovering now and you're thinking, should I now break even and then leave? Or should I now um, double down and put more money in, and, and go along, right? We're always trying to cultivate the right behavior um, Scarlett mentioned content marketing, which always changes and, and there's, there's always a different focus because markets are dynamic. But for us, at least, the answer is always the same. Long-term investing, dollar cost average. It also happens to be best practice and true, <laughs> unless you're a day trader, then all the best, right? But, but the, 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 the answer is always, always the same. So we try and contextualize, we try and add, but not too much, which I think uh, Luno does very well as well. So ultimately, it's... Again, it comes back to, do you feel assured having trusted statuary with your money? And we try and do that every day. Now, the, the, I, I, I relate to your points here, but there is also this, whenever you tell people like, oh, just be patient, go through it, there is bound to be some population there that's like, oh, yeah, same thing, Nia. that means everyone's the same. Now, but this is a long-term game, right? Because I think we only cracked a billion ringgit in AUM for, uh, for the digital investment managers in Malaysia. Total AUM and unit trust, I think it's like 444 billion or something like that. So there's still a much longer trajectory here, very early uh, in the stage, despite, I guess, the concerns around whether these businesses can survive. So maybe talk to us about, uh, can the, I guess, the mandate, the patience from on a, on a group level in terms of how long uh, a startup like this, a robo advisor, can continue to bear with this kind of market and grow. Yeah, so, so what, in case you missed it, Roshan said that uh, the unit trusts have 500 billion bucks, right? So I want to know, to those in the industry, how much of that is really retail and how much is wholesale, right? Still now, we, we don't really know. But another big number is uh, 800 billion in CASA for individuals. So we know, first of all, that there is a lot of cash in the bank. Um, and in our society, in Asian society, a lot of that is in cash and it's not particularly managed. In the US, not that that is the model of whatever, but like it's the other way around. They have much more money invested than they have cash, right? Different position, but I think the transition towards more developed uh, industry is to go from more cash to more managed or more invested uh, monies. So a lot of money around. And yes, we, we are just scratching the surface. And when I was hired five years ago, it was like, yeah, we'll, we'll give Unitrust a really good fight and all that. And five years in, it's like, yeah, actually very hard. It's, like 500, <laughs> it's, it's insane. So, so a lot of these things are embedded. There's no easy way to, to get out of it. But how do you uh, eat an elephant, right? A, a one bite at a time and be, be, have a very big appetite. So we try and do that by consistently providing good returns. And luckily, I've been around enough to know that when we grow, and when we experience scale, it can really move. Like, it can move. Like, like when I joined Startup, I was like, oh, all this hype about hyperscale and nonsense, right? Like, but in 2020, we tripled our AUM. During COVID, good markets help as well. Word of mouth definitely helps as well. But the pipes were there. You just need to be positioned. And when it rains, it pours, man. So, you know, going from where we are now, doubling, tripling in the right conditions, no problem. So a waiting game? What's that? What's that? Is it a waiting game then, basically? Um, you got to be patient. You can't be volatile with your emotions because markets will do that for you. Um, you just have to keep doing the right thing. Be consistent about doing the right thing and trust will come. And once you're, once you're in position, again, then you reap the rewards when it comes. Um, Ian, your side, KDI Invests, I think uh, started early last year. Um, what kind of, I guess... What's the traction been like, given that you started in 22? And again, I guess, the, uh, what is the timeline that you've been given, I guess, to grow this uh, aspect of the business? So, like Ken said, it's if when it rains, it pours. So just be patient, be there, be available. Um, we've seen continuous growth over time. It takes time. It's growing. Every day we see it incrementing up a bit more every day. 
Um, but we're still, I'm, I'm personally impatient. I want more. <laughs> <laughs> so we're always aiming to, to provide better products and, and see how we can meet customers. Um, Digital is a way forward. Uh, let's be honest here. Banks digitized way before that phrase was even a, a term, right? I mean, we all bought computers and mainframes. Uh, the big iron is still floating around driving a lot of banks these days even. So we've always, as banks, as financial institutions, been on the forefront of this. Um, so we see it as the future. We see uh, what we're inventing, what we're developing inside KDI is being uh, used or leveraged and picked up by others. Uh, when we look and explore APIs like banking as a service or wealth as a service, all of that we lose internally as well. So we're experimenting and exploring with our own technologies, um, developing these products. I mean, we have a whole other team, not just in KDI, but there's a whole other team even looking at, say, high speed and high frequency trading algorithms as another investment vehicle for our customers because they want it. Our customers want crypto, so that's why we partnered with your competitors, Tokenize. Um, but you know, hey, you know, if you want crypto, pick up who's who you're most comfortable with. I say go for Luno if it's if it's the right one for you. So it's, um, and that's also something else to believe as well. It's about partnerships, about ecosystems. Technology enables all these things, but at the end of the day, it's what our customers want. And we wouldn't be doing this if our customers said crypto is terrible, we don't want it, or digital advisory is terrible, we think it's a waste of time. Or unit trusts are horrible, right? We, unit trusts are a valuable part of a portfolio. You need to have it because our customers expect it, right? Um, and it comes back also to the remisers and agents. Uh, there's still a valuable portion of the uh, equation because our customers want it. But coming all the way back to your question, digital is a facet. It's a built-in. It's the DNA of banking, even though we don't think it. Even though we still think paper is uh, supreme, it's not. Actually, the, the accounts and ledgers have been digital for ages by now. Um, and it's just a part of the evolution. So be patient with the, uh, with the evolution. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Azlan, I think we want to talk about what the SMB sees as key trends ahead. Because as I mentioned earlier, as of the SE 2022 annual report, AUM for the licensed robot advisories, 1.4 billion ringgit. That's at the end of 2022. Um, versus the 488 billion AUM held by unit trust funds. What do you see as the trends, tools, tactics ahead to catalyze digital wealth adoption and growth here in Malaysia, or is it just wait, we got to be patient and wait and then build? Is there anything that can catalyze it? I think it's, it's always important to understand that why a customer comes to you or why a customer comes to ASNB. Number one is trust. ASNB has been around, like I said, for about 40 years now, and we have delivered consistent returns without fail, rain or shine. So, but that can only go so far because the, the challenges from the market disruptors like your stashaways and your Lunos, you can't stop that. No matter how big you are, we have so many examples of Kodak and Nokia and all that stuff where size doesn't matter. If you don't adapt, you're not going to be able to survive. So, ASNB and PNB is always on the lookout, not just to enhance its own digital offerings, because we know the future is the current Gen Zs, I guess, is the youngest one. I don't, I lost. Could right. be alphas as well at this rate, right? <laughs> All right. So that is the future. Uh, we, we can't expect the, 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 the baby boomers, the first investors in PNB and ASNB to be around the next 30 years. It is this next crop. But at the same time, going back to an earlier point you made, the younger ones don't have the wealth yet, yet you need to establish that relationship now so that when they do reach that financial planning lifestyle of wealth accumulation, then they will always remember that, okay, ASNB is there and ASNB is also digitally present because nobody likes to go to a branch. <laughs> Probably the most consistent thing we've heard today. <laughs> I, I, I have 32 branches to manage. <laughs> I don't like to go to my branch sometimes because the parking is, it's, it's not on purpose. It's literally not on purpose. We don't find a place to open up a branch just because it doesn't have parking. It's not a on purpose. It's always the location itself. So. 
as I mentioned earlier, because ASNB's customers is literally from cradle to the grave, and the future is going to be probably overweighted towards digital, it is either a combination of ASNB as an organization embracing digital, but also via the APIs that are available at ASNB for us to collaborate, integrate, and work to with other fintech players, maybe, who knows? So the catalyst seems to be the more disruptors you have in the, in the space, you push the bigger players to, I need to change. I can't be sitting on my laurels. I can't be like, okay, I need to provide this market an opportunity, uh, the, what they want. And these businesses have showed that there's a demand for that. So thank you to you guys as well for entering the market and doing that. Um, folks, we've got about nine minutes left. I got a few more questions here, but of course I'm more interested in your questions as well. Um, so if anyone has any questions, just raise your hand. Uh, Mike Reynolds will come to you and we're more than happy to take your questions. Oh, brilliant. We have questions here. Hello, uh, Fuad here from Halogen Capital. And uh, unfortunately, I, this question does not represent Halogen Capital. <laughs> it's a personal question and unfortunately I have to address it to Inche Aslan. Uh, uh, I'm glad to hear that ASMB is on this path towards digitalization. And um, we can all agree that we don't quite like going to the branch. Uh, sometimes they have very good managers and you build a good rapport with them. But uh, that's maybe the tail risk, the 1%. Uh, and to that end, ASNB does have a cap on how much you can withdraw from the portal. And via other means, say like banking partners, you can only, you, you can't withdraw. I think you can only inject maybe. I, I don't know if that's been superseded. I haven't checked for a long time because when you know it's closed, you, you don't really bother to go anymore. Um, what is, is there some kind of roadmap of uh, eventually lowering down the barriers and the floodgates of, of, of uh, fungibility in and out via the digital space? Thanks. Okay, thank you. To me, my soalan favorite, I get that question a lot because <laughs> <laughs> the redemption for unit trust funds managed by ASNB at digital banks or digital channels managed by banks is not allowed at this moment in time, first. So the second one is the only op other option rather than a physical one is basically via my ASNB and that's capped to about 2,000 ringgit a month. So I can assure you it's not a technical limitation. Okay, it's not. Not my boss will kill me. Right? <laughs> it's not a technical limitation but it's actually more of educating the public that, for example, I'm assuming is you're referring to ASB lah kan? ASB. Ah, ASW, okay, ASM2, right? Because it's very easy for the public to confuse ASNB's unit trust fixed price funds, which is kept at one ringgit. The price is always one ringgit, whether you buy or sell, with a savings account. Because I think in any financial planning advisory, there's a difference between savings and investing. So allowing the ease of withdrawing unlimited amounts online changes the motive for you to save, or sorry, to invest with ASNB. So that's why we want to make sure that if you want to use ASW, ASM2 as your emergency fund, it should be used only in emergency because when it is easy to access, then it no longer becomes an investment fund, it becomes your regular checking account. I hope that answers your question. All right, folks, any other questions coming from the crowd? So my, my question is uh, directed to Ian. I think if you recall, last year uh, we reported on your initiative in Embedded Wealth, right? And then Datok Che was uh, sharing a whole suite of solutions and a whole suite of startups that you guys invested in. So question number one is, how's progress on that so far? Because you have Rakuten, KDI, Invest, and, and a whole suite of things. And the follow-up question is that you do also have an investment in tokenized, and you're also looking at partnerships in IEO as well. Uh, given the current market, has the board reconsidered your uh, position and, and your commitment towards the crypto space? If anything, actually, I think they've doubled down. So uh, I'll tackle it from the ecosystem view. So we're very much, very much of the opinion we can't do it all ourselves, especially when it comes into these new age products and services. So we, have you seen, we've partner with a lot of different fintechs. 
uh, we're kind of playing Pokemon and got to catch them all in the sense that we're trying to catch <laughs> every license out there. And so Datuk Che has this really nice uh, roadmap of you know, every license we've got, which basically is at this point, everything from the, almost everything from the Securities Commission, either ourselves or with a partner. Um, the only thing we can't do is give you a credit card or mortgage, basically, at this point. Um, so we're catching them all, building it all out. Uh, if anything, we're doubling down on that approach to build out these ecosystems. And yes, we are continuing on the embedded journey uh, as we go. I mentioned earlier, we're working on uh, API-ifying everything. That's uh, the point where you could pull everything through a single API and using that internally, which we are doing. Uh, targeting next year to do our final release, our public release. Uh, we're very excited by that. Uh, and we're talking with all of our partners, with the regulators, with industry, everyone that we can think of to, um, to, to develop the right products and portfolios that we need. Happy with it answer, Vincent? Okay. Uh, Mr. Aslan, we have a question from uh, YouTube. In light of the legal status of cryptocurrencies in Malaysia, we'll put asterisks around the legal status in Malaysia, um, is ASNB PNB exploring the possibility of incorporating digital assets like crypto into its investments for investment investment portfolios or funds? All right, yeah, digital assets, yes, correct, that's the terminology. Oh, this, this is the tough <laughs> question. <laughs> because depending on the answer, I'm either going to get a lot of phone calls or no phone calls. <laughs> All right. So I think that there is always need. There is always a need for diversification, because except for 2021, where actually the fixed income and both the equity markets went south at the same time, when it's normally inverse, it has always been a relationship that correlates with each other. Now, to say that PNB as the fund manager of ASMB's unit trust funds is not looking at it at this moment in time, I don't think that's fair. But whether it is something that they will go into is probably going to have to go through internally all the risk parameters and risk assessments and the suitability assessments. Because at the end of the day, ASNB's mandate is to increase the wealth of Bumiputras and the Malaysian general in public, right? And we cannot risk that because we've been surviving relatively uh, scandal-free or issue-free for the past 45 years. And to chase returns and invest in a very risky asset to the detriment of the union holders would probably not be entertained, but given how the industry continues to evolve and how the regulators continue to introduce new methods and new ways, it is not beyond comprehension that it might be, although I can't speak on behalf of my fund managers, unfortunately. I guess there's a responsibility the for wealth preservation, uh, right? It, for someone as sizable as, as SNB and how long you've been in the space and the demographic, there is that wealth preservation mandate that is actually quite important. Um, folks, we've got about two minutes left. I don't want to delay people for lunch. A reminder, it's at the Oak Room. Just follow the line of people that are walking there after this. Any other questions from the crowd? Otherwise, I'm going to ask my wrap-up question, and then we can proceed. Three, two, one. Everyone wants to go for lunch. That's why there are no hands up here. So, last question. Um, Azan, I already asked you this question, so I'll ask the three of you. Um, I think the, the key theme that we seem to be hearing is that it's still early. There's patience is needed from here. Don't look at the bull market of 2021 as the barometer for how we should be judging digital wealth in the longer term. Um, that said, you know, having uh, the amount of dry powder needed to survive to reach that, that inflection point is also important. So what do the three of you see as the catalyst going forward for digital uh, wealth in Malaysia, in the region, um, is it simply about waiting or are there, going to, are there external factors that you're looking at that can help drive this forward? Um, let's start with Scarlett and move down this way. Yeah, so I think for Luno, um, what, I f what I believe is the catalyst is definitely like we do need to provide a product that is simple and convenient to use, which is a mobile first approach because every one of us has a mobile phone, a smartphone, right? And we have various app apps, applications. And, and I don't know, uh, previously there's a talk about like, how much time we spend on social media and everything. 
So I think in Luna, we're committed to continue uh, to invest the effort in terms of um, developing uh, easy to use, easy to navigate uh, mobile applications, uh, especially in terms of uh, a digital wealth investing product like our surf. So that's definitely key. And then second of all, I think the other thing that I would like to highlight is definitely on um, easily con consumable content. So everyone's, uh, I think in recent generations, the attention span of digesting information as well as absorbing things is getting shorter and shorter. Just so it's TikTok like, how, la, just say TikTok. Uh, yeah. So how do we actually, you know, get information out there? Uh, in a manner that they could actually be uh, digestible by our investors or customers. So that's also another key, right? How do we keep up with the, the trend and the content and whatever it is? And definitely third is um, regulation and localization is still very key to what we believe that will be the catalyst of, you know, uh, growing this space. Uh, we need to work with uh, stakeholders, regulators, policymakers, any other law enforcement agencies or industry partners to continue to drive this. Uh, in fact, I was in an a AML conference just a few days ago where we are talking about a national scam awareness campaign. So those are very important things that we do need to continue to drive the effort and you know uh, invest our time in. Uh, and also, like, uh, how can we support Malaysian investors to better understand this new age product, new investment class, uh, where it's easily accessible at your fingertips, right? So those are just my opinion. Thanks. Thank you, Scarlett. Ian? So if you, if you go back to the very beginning of banking and financial institutions all the way back to ancient Italy, <laughs> um, <laughs> banks are really about doing two things. The first one is transforming risk, and the second one is about delivering trust. We take risk of different kinds and package them up and give them back so that people can manage their risk, and we act as a trusted third-party intermediary. It's very, very scary to go buy crypto directly, right? <laughs> that's why we have Luno, that's why we have Tokenize, that's why we have the rest. We have to deliver both of those to be relevant as we go forward. And so as we look back to 2021 or even to back to other bull markets, it's all about being there and providing that trust and that risk management to our customers. So as long as we keep that at the center, everything else becomes almost, almost easy. Ken? Top wealth tech startup, according to FinTech News, and it's, it's the voters and the judges. You know, the people have spoken. So, <laughs> um, I, you know, when we were carrying the trophy, it was, people were like, oh, it's quite heavy. It's like, oh, these are the expectations of clients. So, so <laughs> carry, it, carry it carefully. Um, so you asked about catalysts. So when Jay Power starts lowering interest rates, we all hope and pray for a broad market rally, and that will can I, definitely. Can I, can I remove that one? <laughs> like you, something you may. Else. You may. Outside you may. of Jay Powell. Outside of Jay Powell. Um, there's nothing else. I, I mean, <laughs> no, markets, markets are, are are huge, right? But we're always looking at what's the next big thing, right? So coming into this market with, look, we can give you multi-asset portfolio with global exposure. Okay, that was a killer app. And then the second thing was popularizing uh, money market funds. Even that word, like money market funds, like so 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 terrible, right? So. So we popularized it, called it Stashway Simple, and, and then everyone copied us, and then, you know, but, but it comes with success, right? So what's the next big thing? What is that thing we want every Malaysian to say, hey, this is something we really should do. Um, how do I escape this middle class and become a high net worth, right? So we want to democratize what the people on top already have and make it available to everyone. So not an easy thing. And what I will say, just, just people in the room is, as gatekeepers, listen to the customer, but also you, you insert your expertise because what clients want may not be in their best interest. Taking out 2000, for example, it's, it's tough love. It's for your own good. So, so it's, it, it's, it's in our hands to really manage that wealth and come up with best things and, and position you guys to also reach that top. So, yeah, thanks. So democratizing higher net worth products, can I get a piece of PE, equity? Angel investing, crypto. On there? Yeah, we'll talk after this. Because I know Singapore uh, got some interesting products. We don't have that here yet. We'll talk after this. <laughs> <laughs>